Thank you. It feels like it's been a long, long time since I've stood up here and brought God's Word to you. And I think it's been about four or five weeks, which is a bit too long. But it is good to be able to bring, uh, hopefully, what God is saying to us today um, as we look at Lazarus. It's a very well-known story. We had a very long reading this morning. We've had a series of long readings, but we're in John's Gospel. With John's Gospel, you need long readings to actually work out what is going on. It's hard just to take a segment out of John's Gospel and sort of look at it in isolation. We have to see where it fits in the whole progression from that extremely wonderful prologue which we always hear at Christmas through to the end of the Gospel. I suppose the same could be said for any part of Scripture, really. We always need to know the context and the setting. As we get closer to Easter, our eyes start to turn more towards the cross. The journey through Lent that we've been on is starting to draw to a close. Significant events of Holy Week and Easter are drawing ever closer. We pick up the story today with Jesus and his disciples having withdrawn from Jerusalem prior to his return to the city for the final Passover. John 10, verse 40. Jesus' preparation for the Passover is interrupted by an urgent request for help from a family that is especially close to him. We meet Mary and Martha. John even tells us it's the same Mary who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair, which is actually the next chapter in John 12. This is an indication that John is assuming the reader has some knowledge of the story and they are already familiar with the incident. Jesus is interrupted and they tell Mary and Martha Satan that Lazarus is sick. Yet in verse 6, we're told he stayed where he was. For two more days. It's a stark reminder is this. That things will be done in God's timing. And not necessarily our own. We return back to this later in the chapter. At verse 21 when Martha says to Jesus. Lord if you had been here. My brother would not have died. Perhaps with the state of things in the world at the moment. It might feel like we're living in that state of waiting for the Lord to act, but we might feel that he isn't doing anything. Perhaps we can associate with Mary and Martha this morning. There are many different stories of things feeling right, perhaps for a church or for yourself, and we expect them to happen, yet they don't happen in the way that we would expect. There's often times of frustration when it feels like the Lord is ignoring our prayers for the proper solution. We may know what we want to do. It might look perfect for us, but something stops it happening. In many ways, we've been praying for justice, peace, prosperity, and harmony between nations and races since time began. Yet it still hasn't happened. Well, perhaps since Babel. And it still hasn't happened. God is not playing games with us when it comes to things like this, friends. His timing is different to our own. Tom Wright explores the opening of this chapter by asking the simple question, what was Jesus doing in those two days? And Tom Wright believes that Jesus was praying. He was already starting to wrestle with the Father's will. The disciples are right when, verse 8, when they say the Judeans have been wanting to stone him, and it would be mad to go back now. That's where we are in this place. Bethany is only two miles or so from Jerusalem on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. So he would have been within easy reach for the authorities. So the disciples are clearly cautious saying, why go back now? You know that they're after you. Now often, we think of the story of Lazarus as being about Lazarus and his resurrection as a precursor to Jesus' resurrection. Yet perhaps we miss an important part of the story by doing this. Because this story is also about Jesus. It begins with the disciples warning him not to go back to Judea. And it ends, had we gone on to verse 50, with the high priest declaring that one man must die for the people. 
In verses 41 and 42, Jesus thanks the Father that he has heard his prayer. This could be a reference to those two strange silent days between Mary telling Jesus her brother was ill and Lazarus dying. Perhaps Jesus was praying for Lazarus in those two days. Perhaps he was praying for wisdom and guidance as to his own plans and movements. But somehow these two stories are bound up together. And what happens when Lazarus is raised from the dead is on one hand a principal reason why the authorities want Jesus out of the way. But on the other hand, it is the most powerful sign yet in the sequence of signs that we see throughout John's Gospel. And that's why we have this story on this Sunday in Lent as Passion Tide begins. As the season of Lent starts to get darker, as we get closer and closer to those events of Holy Week, it sets the scene of what is to come before Palm Sunday and the joyful entry into Jerusalem to the drastic turn of events that happen when we get to Good Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday. We're heading towards those events which we celebrate at Easter, which change the entire course of human history. When Jesus goes to the cross for me and for you. But what it shows is that the time of waiting is vital. Jesus needed to be in prayer, exploring the Father's will in the intimacy and union of which he spoke. And it is only then that he acts. Only when he has spent time with the Father that he acts. He doesn't act as Mary and Martha want him to do, but he waits. And because he waits, he then acts in a way that is beyond their wildest dreams. Imagine being Mary or Martha, seeing your brother die. We know that that is the end. Bear in mind, this is taking place before the resurrection. Nobody has beaten death. How must Mary and Martha have felt? Can you imagine what it must have been like when they see Lazarus rise and come out of the tomb? It's just beyond comprehension. It's also a story about patience. It's a hard lesson to hear, and it's a hard lesson to learn. Patience is one of those difficult things, which when we ask God to show us patience, I'm sure we've all got many testimonies, we know that he really does respond, because things seem to take an age. Over these past few weeks, I've been reflecting on where things are in the life of the church, both locally and nationally. It feels like we're in a period of waiting. Perhaps no one knows the right answer to the way things are at the moment. Perhaps it's because the Lord is making us wait in these troubled times. By waiting, even though it is incredibly difficult, we'll then be surprised beyond our wildest dreams in the same way that Mary and Martha were surprised beyond their wildest dreams when their brother walked out of that grave after four days. It's a reminder, friends, is this passage that God can do far more than we can imagine. Now, the word Bethany means literally the house of the poor. And there is some evidence that it was just that. A place where poor, needy, and sick people could be cared for a kind of hospice outside of the city, if you like. We know that Jesus has been there before. But when he visits this time, he once again shows and assures the local people that the promise of the kingdom is one in which the poor would celebrate and the sick would be healed. In John 12, 1 to 8, when we hear of Mary pouring the, the nard on his feet, it's expensive perfume. And we know that in Bethany, that extravagance does not go down well. People complain because it's so expensive. So we know it is a place where the poor are. And that, to me, is really powerful that Jesus does one of his greatest signs in that very place. If we think of Isaiah and Luke, where he reads from the scroll, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring freedom to the captives, etc. You know, there's plenty of references to that scripture where the poor will be exalted. This story of Lazarus being raised from the dead is one where Jesus surprises people. He overturns their expectations. He doesn't go when he's asked. He goes eventually when it was right for the Lord to go. 
That is, despite his disciples' objections, saying, but if you go, Lord, they will get you. Jesus speaks about sleep, meaning death. And then in verse 9, there's a strange little saying about people walk by day, do not stumble. To unpack that verse a little bit, it feels like Jesus is saying that the only way to know where you are going is to follow him. If we try and steer our own course by our own understanding, we will trip up. We will fall because we will be in the dark. I know that all too well, and I'm sure many of us here know what it's like when we go our own way and things go wrong. We trip up, we fall, and then we have to turn around and come back to Jesus. But if we stick close to him, we will see the situation from his point of view even if that means days and perhaps years of puzzlement and wondering why nothing seems to be happening. But, and there is a but, we will come out of the right place in the end. That's, why we need to, that's what we need to remember. If we're puzzled or confused or frustrated at the way things are going, as long as we are following Jesus, he will get us to the right place in the end when the time is right, not our time, his time. As I was preparing, I was reminded of Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, but my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That is exactly what we are seeing in this passage of Scripture today. That we are seeing it. Mary and Martha responding as a human being would do. Lord, if you had been there, it would have happened. But it's two days later when Jesus goes back and brings Lazarus back to life. It's important for us to remember this, I believe, as we journey on through whatever lies ahead. Whether that's debates on doctrine in the church, whether that's what we do whether we're going to do locally as missional outreach, whether it's looking at our own personal discipleship journey, whatever it is, friends, we need to remember that we're doing it for Jesus. And if it seems like he isn't answering, persevere. Persevere in the waiting. If we can persevere, we'll come out at the right place in the end. On my pre-priest in ordination retreat, I got caught up in listening to one song over and over and over again. I'm sure I've shared this with you before. It's Take Courage by Bethel. And the line that struck me, which I was singing for about those four days, he's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. When we are waiting for the Lord to act, we are not on our own. When we are waiting for the Lord to act, he is right there at the side of us. He is guiding us and supporting us through all of this. We're also, in this passage, introduced to Thomas, one of John's great minor characters. He's loyal. He's slow to understand things, but he's determined to go on putting one foot in front of the other at Jesus' command. He speaks words that feel very heavy, particularly as we know what is to come. He says, let us also go that we may die with him. What a statement of faith is that from Thomas. We know, of course, the disciples don't die with Jesus on the cross, on on Calvary. But it is the right response to following the call of Jesus on our lives. Let us also go that we may die with him. When we go forward with him, we don't know what lies ahead. Our hopes and plans often get thwarted. But if we go with Jesus, even into the jaws of death, we will be walking in the light rather than arrogantly following our own plans and ambitions which lead us to trip up. Perhaps this morning you're sat here feeling that your plans or ambitions have been thwarted by God. Perhaps you're thinking of things that you may think, well, why has God not acted? This should have happened, but it's not. Where are you in all of this, Lord? I hope, friends, if that's you, that this passage shows that that is is strangely quite normal when we're following Jesus. Because we're following his plans, 
not our plans. As I, it's, he said in Isaiah, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. So if you are feeling frustrated with God this morning, you're in good company because Mary and Martha were also frustrated. If only you had have come, Lord, is what she says. And I imagine it probably is not said, well, if only you'd come, Lord. It's probably with a lot of passion. If only you had come. And then Lazarus walks out of that grave. Living the life as a disciple of Jesus is not plain sailing. It's not an easy ride. It doesn't protect us from the storms of life. But it leads to something that is truly life-fulfilling and engaging. Let's allow Jesus to come and shatter our expectations this morning. To do something more incredible than we could ever possibly imagine. See, if we move a little further into this passage, we see a whole new perspective. Until we meet Thomas, John is essentially showing us what a life with Jesus might entail. Then we get presented with something that we can all associate with. The grief of Mary and Martha due to the joy of Lazarus coming out of the grave. That range of emotions that must be felt will have been intense. And I think we often skip over it because we know, well, okay, it's the story of Lazarus where he's going to walk out of the grave. But just imagine being in that place. In this country, we tend to hide our emotions at funerals. It's not the done thing to show emotion. If you cry in this country, it's seen as a sign of weakness. Utter rubbish. Elsewhere in the world, there is a much more public outpouring of grief. And we see that public outpouring in this passage. Both Mary and Martha respond in that similar way. If only. And that's often something we reflect on when we're confronted with death. If only this could have happened. Jesus is then moved to tears. A reminder that from John that he is the word made flesh. Thinking back again to that wonderful prologue of John's gospel. And it takes us back to Isaiah 53 verse 4. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now that doesn't necessarily reflect only grief when someone has died. It could refer back to those plans and ambitions that have been thwarted. It could be a dream of yours that has not yet happened. It could be something that is painful, and we have to keep taking it back to the Lord. Before I met Amanda, I often struggled with being single. I had to take it back to the Lord time and again, often on my knees in tears. But I had to keep going back. What is it this morning that you need to keep going back to God with? That you're struggling with? What can you take back to him today and hear him say to you, I'm with you in the waiting. Of course, we also see the echoes of the story between Lazarus and Jesus, as I alluded to earlier. Jesus asks, where have you laid him? Mary asks the same question in the garden. The stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away in the garden. All of this echoes what we will hear in just two weeks' time. We then get to one of the most dramatic moments in the whole story of Jesus. When Lazarus comes out of that grave. If we think back to Mark 5, when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter, he orders almost everyone out of the room and tells them not to say anything. Yet now, in John 11, he is standing in front of a large crowd. He's putting his whole reputation on the line and he says, Lazarus, come out. In a heart-stopping moment, Lazarus comes out. Just imagine what that must have felt like to see Lazarus walk out wrapped in the grave clothes. Maybe it was horror. Maybe it was overwhelming joy. It was probably a mix of everything of those two and everything in between. But we find ourselves drawn to awe, thanks, and hope as we hear of Lazarus coming out of the grave. Jesus doesn't respond to some of the questions that are raised. Martha in verse 39 says, well, there'll be a bad odor. Jesus doesn't respond to this because he knows that when the stone is rolled away, there would be no odor. It points us back again to those two days, silent days on the other side of the Jordan when Jesus waited. 
Before he even told the disciples of the problem, Jesus was praying. He would have been praying that his friend will be raised from the dead. A precursor of what is to come. Jesus will have been praying for Lazarus to come back to life. But equally, he'll have been aware that he was walking to his own death. For Lazarus, the process of death is simply reversed. He would, of course, die one day again. But we know that the journey Jesus will make when he goes to death would be that he goes through death, he beats it, and he comes out on the other side into a new life. So as we get closer to the cross, let's pause and reflect, not only on the power of God that is demonstrated in these verses, but also on the faith and the prayer of Jesus. He needed to spend time praying and waiting. So if Jesus has to, surely we must have to too. Jesus doesn't respond immediately to Mary and Martha. He makes them wait for two days. If Jesus doesn't respond immediately to our plans, our hopes or our ambitions when they feel thwarted, we're in good company. Mary and Martha are then surprised beyond expectations and imaginations when Lazarus walks out of the grave. So what is it, friends, that we are waiting for, where God will surprise us beyond expectation and imagination? Persevere in prayer. Persevere in the waiting. Continue to seek him. Continue to walk with him to the cross, through death and out the other side. The events of these next two weeks that we remember at Easter changes the course of human history forever. If God can raise Lazarus and Jesus from the dead, what more can he do for us? Amen.